I just want to say thank you to everybody for coming here this morning, and I also want to extend a special thanks to my team. This is fabulous. So here I go. We're going to talk about common foot and ankle injuries in the dancer and their clinical evaluation. So as Dr. McKaylee was noting earlier, the majority of these injuries in dancers are overuse, although of course you can have traumatic injuries as well. And I just want to take a look at a couple of the statistics. So the foot and ankle represent uh, about anywhere between 34 to 62 percent of all injuries reported. You're like, well, geez, that seems like a pretty huge span, a pretty huge range. And that all gets back to, well, what exactly is an injury? And who's reporting the injury? And who's categorizing the injury? Is it the dancer reporting the injury? And dancers often don't associate pain with injury. They're like, OK, I'm in pain. I'm a dancer. Or is it a clinician diagnosing the injury? So that's why you can sometimes see these discrepancies in the literature. When we look at the literature, it represents about 40% incidence in classical ballet, roughly about 40% incidence in modern dancers. And then when we actually look at the Irish dance literature, which Dr. Stein has done, it represents about 33% of the foot in Irish dance, and then 22% of, of the ankle in Irish dance. And we tend to think that female classical ballet dancers have a higher incidence of foot and ankle than male dancers and modern dancers, and that's probably because they dance on point. Before we delve too much further into the actual injuries, I think it's just good to have a clear understanding of what are we demanding of the foot and the ankle. We kind of conceptually can understand this, but what exactly is going on? Well, the foot and the ankle is really the main base of support in the human body, right? We're bipeds. We don't walk around on all fours, or maybe some people do, but we won't talk about that. Um, it's also the, the primary shock absorber in the human body. It's also this lever for very intricate patterns of movement. And it's also what the dancer utilizes to help with their expression of a particular form of movement or style of movement. And it's what complements the dancer's line. And there's this dichotomy where you're supposed to be incredibly flexible, yet incredibly strong at the same time. And you can apply these, a lot of these concepts throughout the human body for a dancer. In the position of demi point, which is utilized throughout a variety of dance forms. You're going to hear a lot about classical ballet today, but I do not want you to think that we're neglecting the other dance forms. Modern, contemporary, lyrical, Irish dance, hip hop, tap, flamenco. A lot of them utilize this demi point position, right? And which is a, a very vulnerable position to put your foot in. And the other takeaway point that I want to emphasize is that we're here, to talk, we're here today to talk about the foot and ankle, but you should never neglect the kinetic chain because issues throughout the kinetic chain can influence other body parts. So a dancer may come in and say, hey, Dr. Quinn, I have foot pain and I would be a poor clinician if I didn't look north and say, okay, well, let me take a look at them in terms of their alignment. Let me take a look at their spine, at their posture, at their hip strength, et cetera, so forth. So this concept does apply. You want to take a look throughout. And then this is just a slide, again, emphasizing this concept of injury and what exactly is an injury. In order for us to really understand injury, we have to have a clear definition of it. And the dancer's definition may not necessarily be the clinician's definition of it. Because a dancer describes as an injury as something that's really going to keep them from dancing or moving. And Mary Jean Lederbach is a prominent researcher out of New York who came up with this definition for JDMS, which is pain or physical dysfunction that results in misparticipation in class, rehearsal, or performance. But I want to reiterate that we really want to acknowledge pain. When a dancer starts to describe, hey, something doesn't feel right, or I'm, having, I'm, I'm feeling pain, don't ignore it. It's better to come in sooner rather than later. And so I put this slide up to really emphasize early problem recognition. Come in now, because it's a lot harder later. The basic things are great. You know, rest, ice, compression, elevation. We never want to neglect those. And often I'll get the question, well, when should I stop dancing? Or when do I really know it's actually an issue? Well, obviously, with an acute injury, most likely you want to stop dancing and get assessed. So a bad landing from a jump, a bad fall, et cetera. Or if you notice that there's pain and the pain is persisting, it's not this pain that's like, oh, I kind of tweaked something, but I feel like it's gone away, or it's lingering and, or increasing. And never underestimate the benefit of ice. So I'm going to take you through a brief little anatomy session. And just as a quick little kind of, I guess, overview, how, how many people here are, are physicians or nurses, nurse practitioners? 
physician's assistants, um, athletic trainers, uh, some physical therapists, dancers, and acupuncturists, and chiropractors. So we had a whole, whole wide range. And some of this, I apologize if you're like, oh, God, Bridget, I already know all of this. But I think it's always good just to reiterate the anatomy because the anatomy is what's based on the injury. And so we're going to start with the bones of the foot and the ankle. Do you guys know how many bones there are in the foot? 26. You know that. Yeah, there's 26 bones of the foot, so, so tremendous number. Um, and each of those bones have articulations with each other, and those are called joints. And those joints are often lined by cartilage or articular cartilage, like the shiny white stuff on a chicken bone. The foot is divided into different sections. You have your forefoot, which is over here, which is your phalanges and metatarsals. You have your midfoot, which in court encompasses your cuneiform, cuboid, and navicular. And then you have your hind foot, which is your calcaneus and your talus. And each section of your foot actually is responsible for, for a different aspect of stability, but I won't dive too much into that today. We don't ever want to neglect these two little bones, the sesamoids, everyone's heard of these, at the bottom of the first MTP point, or jo joint, excuse me. And I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but I feel like I remember reading that the term sesamoid came out of the Greek term sesame seed. Yeah, yeah. And that I think that the Greeks really felt that your soul could emanate right through your sesamoid bone. So when people come in and they're like, what are those two little bones and how could they give me so much trouble? Uh, well, guess what? Your soul comes right through these bones. Um, <laughs> and then looking at the ankle joint, this is composed of your shin bone or your tibia, right here, your fibula, and then your talus, and here's the, the ankle joint proper. And that's truly more of a, a hinge joint, although obviously you do have some lateralized movement there as well. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the static stabilizers, so the ligaments, or what attach bone to bone. Um, and you have multiple ligaments throughout the ankle and throughout the foot. Some of the important ones involve the lateral ankle ligaments, which are often injured when you quote unquote sprain your ankle. In medicine, it sounds like there's a lot of technical terms, but really they all make sense when you break it down. So a ligament such as the anterior talofibular ligament, which is right here. Anterior means in the front, talo means talus, fibular, so it connects the talus and the fibula. So it's really just a matter of kind of piecing together, okay, what, what does the ligament attach to and et cetera, so forth. And so these also help provide some stability. Have you guys heard of, an, of a high ankle sprain before? Yeah. So that one involves the, the soft tissue structures that support the tibia and the fibula. So the interosseous membrane, there's two ligaments both in front and the back of the tip fib. And then there's the foot. And we often neglect thinking about sometimes the ligaments of the foot. We often focus on the ligaments in the ankle. But there are tremendous ligaments throughout the foot. Um, and some of these ligaments culminate and form what we call joint capsules. So we have these capsules throughout the MTP joint and the metatarsal phalangeal joints. And you can think of the plantar fascia as a big broad ligament on the bottom of the foot. And then there's the dynamic stabilizers. So this is what allows the dancers to do what they want to do. Um, and you have a variety of different muscles and muscle tendinous units throughout the foot and ankle. Some of the common ones, and actually I remember Dr. Stein teaching me this as a fellow, um, on the medial aspect of the ankle, you have some muscle tendon units that help with medial arch support and also pointing the foot. So you have Tom, Dick, and Harry. So tibialis posterior, flexor digitorum, and flexor hallucis. Obviously your Achilles in the back, and then your peroneus on the side. And then there's these small muscles in the foot that people often neglect but play a, key, play a key role in the health of the dancer's foot, and they do need to do extra work to maintain that. And then you have the actions of the foot and ankle. So in medical jargon, when you point your foot, your plantar flexing. The opposite of that, where you bring your toe towards your nose, is called dorsiflexion, so when a dancer goes into a deep plie. Then you have inversion, where you roll it in, and then eversion, where you roll it out. And then similar with the toe, you can have flexion and extension as well. And there are a variety of injuries that a dancer can have, and I do not have enough time today to go into extreme detail with every single one of them. 
but they can start right at the MTP joint. You can sprain the MTP joint. You can develop a bunion at the MTP joint. You can have arthritis at the MTP joint. You can have sesamoid injuries. The metatarsals, you can have stress fractures, traumatic fractures. You can even have neuromas, which are these thickenings of the nerves in the foot that can give you symptomatology. You can have midfoot sprains, midfoot fractures, cuboid subluxations, cuboid fractures, plantar fasciitis, and the list goes on. It's pretty extensive. So what I want to do is take you through a couple cases today. Um, so these are all dancers who have presented to my clinic. And I want to walk you through what I do as a clinician and how I look at these individuals and the things that I order to help me in my diagnosis and my typical management options. So first case here is a 16-year-old female ballerina who reports ankle pain. And she points to the posterior lateral, so kind of the back slash side aspect of her ankle. And she reports that she's having a lot of trouble getting up into dummy point and full point. She feels like something's really blocking her. And she's probably been seen by another physician who has advised that she maybe has Achilles tendonitis. Um, but because of this discomfort, she's saying that she's really avoiding a lot of point work in class. And she's denying any traumatic event. Maybe at some point she had an ankle sprain. So at this point, it's my job to really take a look at this dancer. Take a look, have both shoes off, have her standing, have her sitting. And what I notice is that she has this fullness, almost this swelling in that kind of back lateral corner of her ankle. And when I have her passive, when I passively plantar flex her, and I compare it to the opposite side, so you always want to look at the symmetry, I notice it's restrictive and it also actively it's restricted. And when I really provocatively plantar flex, really provocatively put her into a point position, it's quite uncomfortable. I don't mean to be cruel. Um, and she's not tender over the Achilles tendon, otherwise she looks pretty good. So in medicine, we have this thing called a differential where we're like, okay, what are, what are the top 10 things that this could potentially be and how do I want to go about working this up? So what do you guys think? What could be going on with this dancer and what do you want to do? Poster lateral ankle pain, restrictions in demi point, os trigonum, could, could, could it be anything else? Or is that the only thing? Now that we've seen Dr. McKee. <laughs> and we're all here for dancers, whatever. Um, you know, yeah, it could be an ostrigonum, could be a soft tissue impingement, absolutely. And so I end up obtaining plain film radiographs, and here we have that lateral demi-point x-ray. And x-rays are great at showing us bones. They don't show us the soft tissue, but they can give us a tremendous amount of detail about bone, joint, alignment, and here we have that dancer here in demi point. So here's her tibia, her fibula, her talus, her calcaneus. This is the back of her ankle. And what do you see? The osteoglossus. Absolutely. So you get discomfort with an ostrigonum, perhaps for a variety of reasons, but it's thought, as Dr. McKeeley said, that there's this nutcracker effect where you're getting this compression of tissue uh, deep in the back of the ankle behind that tibial lip and the calcaneus. So the ostrigonum is thought to be an accessory bone, but perhaps there's some developmental variant based on being a classical ballet dancer. Perhaps there's an association with a fracture of the steta. And it's thought to be present in about 10 to 15% of the population, and bilateral maybe about 50% of the time. And we often actually do see these things unroofed after ankle sprains, and that might have to do with some of the instability about the talus and some increased compression posteriorly. Often we'll find that discomfort predominantly in the posterior lateral corner of the ankle. We'll find that decreased range of motion, right? There's a mechanical block in the back preventing them from plantar flexion. And there can often be an association with the FHL, and I'm gonna talk more about that, because the Oz, and even a prominent posterior tubercle, tubercle, they're very much close in association. So how do I manage these? Well, obviously I obtain my plain film radiographs to confirm. Sometimes I will go forth and get an MRI of the ankle, and that allows me to look at better detail in terms of the joint, the articular cartilage, and also the soft tissue structures, i.e. the FHL, which sits right next to that, that Oz, and make sure that that still looks intact and is okay. And here we have a T1-weighted MRI, sagittal, looking at the side. You've got the Achilles tendon here, the Oz trigonum here, the talus, here's the tibia, and the calcaneus. We often will make a recommendation for limiting the things that make it hurt. So limiting the point work. We, physical therapy 
is going to be without question every single time, every single case, whatever is wrong, they, they go to physical therapy. That's just, consider that a complete given. Physical therapy is always necessary. Um, often we'll focus on posterior flexibility, gastroc soleus flexibility. I even recommended a Strasburg night sock to help kind of keep, keep the, the posterior chain a little more flexible. Uh, changing technique error, I don't do that. That's the job of the teacher. Um, and often surgery to remove that Oz if the dancer really wants to pursue a career in dance. So case number two, you have a 20-year-old female dancer who presents with pain on the inner aspect of her ankle. She has pain with grand plie and fifth, has pain with jumping, demi point, demi plie, so gee, she's in a lot of pain. Uh, she denies any traumatic event, so there was no big trauma. She denies any triggering of the, of the first toe, that kind of catching or locking. And she reports this crunching, God, Doc, I feel like something's crunching in there. So I take a look at her, and she has this fullness and tenderness kind of right beneath and behind that medial malleolus. She has pain when I have her push down or plant her flex with her first toe. And I'm noticing she seems a little stiff about that first toe. So I go ahead and want to be a little savvier, do this FHL stretch test. So I put her ankle in a dorsiflex position with the first MTP, with, or excuse me, with the first metatarsal stabilized. And when the first metatarsal is dorsiflex, she reports pain and you again notice decreased range of motion. And you, some of the simple things I do in the, op, in the office, I'm, I'm not a dance instructor, but I'll often have the dancer go into a quote unquote natural first position and I might see this, now often they don't come with their point shoes, but you might notice that they're pronation, that they're pronating, or if you have them go up into demi point that they're sickling. So this is my differential. On the inner aspect of the ankle, what could be going on? It's not traumatic, I probably don't think it's a traumatic fracture, maybe it's some form of a tendonitis, but which tendon, is it Tom, is it Dick, is it Harry? Who's it gonna be? Is this a kind of atypical presentation of an os trigonum? Is it some sort of weird referral? Maybe it's like a tarsal tunnel or Achilles? What is it? So I have a lot of imaging options at my disposal again, and I always again start with x-rays. People are like, why do you need an x-ray? Don't you just want to get an MRI? No, because the x-rays give me a tremendous amount of information. Maybe I will find that large os trigonum, which would be a key piece of information. So on the x-ray on the far left, I don't see an ostrigonum and things look pretty good. And she's hot enough and irritated enough that we go ahead and decide to pursue an MRI. Now this is a T2 weighted MRI where the fluid comes up as white, again a sagittal view. Here's the talus and here's flexor halysis coming down and this white is an indication of fluid within it and around it, indicative of a tendonitis. What we also now use in the office is bedside ultrasound, which is a dynamic way of evaluating soft tissue structures and even now some bony structures. And Dr. Demacor is going to talk to you more about that. But here we see a course of the tendon with some fluid surrounding it, confirming that it's actually hairy that's causing the problems. So flexor halysis tendonitis is known as dancer's tendonitis or an Achilles tendonitis of the foot. And it often is aggravated because these dancers go through a lot of these repetitive change in foot positions. So at one moment you're going to be in this deep dorsiflexion and that tendon's going to be pulled and taut in the traction. And then bam, they got to get right back up into demiport or up into that full plantar flexion. And the tendon has a long course. It comes down behind the medial mal all the way down up to the first MTP. So it can get irritated anywhere along the course. And so with that crepitus, what can happen, you can get a lot of that friction and inflammation and irritation, you can feel it along the tendon sheath. And often you can get this stickiness and even sometimes some triggering. In the flexor halysis, it's small but mighty, and it crosses, uh, it crosses more than one joint. And so studies have shown us that it works two to three times harder than those crossing only one joint. So it's put a lot of demand on it. Management, you can expect, temporarily stop the point work and the jumps. Physical therapy, always. Uh, you can consider for the inflammation a topical steroid, or excuse me, uh, a steroidal anti-inflammatory that the physical therapist can apply called iontophoresis. Uh, a conserved course of oral non-steroidals, so maybe seven to 10 days of an leave or something of that nature, and correcting faulty techniques. For some activity modifications, I'll often avoid grand plie in all positions, modify their turnout, minimize the demi point and point and jumping. Again, that's the responsibility or what the FHL helps with. 
Rarely do we do injections. You have to be very cautious with that, but ultrasound guided to the peritoneal sheath in surgery as a last resort. And if you recall, I had mentioned how the FHL and the Oz can, can be best friends. If one jumps off the Brooklyn Bridge, the other one does as well. Well, that's what's happening. So here's a picture of the back of the ankle. Here's the talus over here. Here's Harry. Here's Dick. Here's Tom. And here's the Oz. So you can see that they abut each other. They're very close. And here's an MRI of the ankle cut in half. So the foot is, so the, the individual's lying like this on the table. Here's the Achilles. Here's the talus. Here's the Oz. Here's the FHL. So that's why you always have to keep a broad differential. It's not always clear. It's just one thing. It may be a combination. All right, chief complaint. 26-year-old male dancer presents with right ankle pain was landing from a jump, he inverted his right ankle and he heard a pop. He was able to walk but has had progressive swelling, pain, and bruising. When you take a look at him, he's really swollen, he's really bruised, he's diffusely swollen, but a lot of the swelling's off on the lateral aspect of the ankle. You palpate all along the fibula because you want to make sure there's no fracture, and he's maybe minimally tender at, uh, right at the distal tip of the fibula. He's really tender over those lateral ligaments, particular over the ATFL and over the perineal tendon, and he has no other bony tenderness to palpation. So what do you guys think is going on? ATFL injury, right? right. So you get an x-ray, and you always want to get x Well, there are, there are certain criteria that will dictate when you get an x-ray with an ankle injury, but often I get them to be on the safe side to rule out a fibular fracture. Uh, and, and ankle injuries can be tricky little buggers. You can have cuboid fractures, et cetera, and so forth. You, you end up getting an MRI because you're concerned about an occult fracture and you want to look at the severity of the ligamentous injury. And here's the fibula, T2 weighted image. Here's the tibia, here's the talus, and here's all this swelling with the torn ATFL. So this is your common ankle sprain. Everyone's like, nah, it's an ankle sprain. But as Dr. McKaylee was alluding to, these, are, these can be really hard. Um, it's the most common traumatic dance injury that we see. And it often happens with improper landings and rolling over the ankle, especially in that unstable position of demi point, with the ATFL being the one most commonly injured. And what are the risk factors? Well, if you've had a prior ankle sprain, that's certainly a risk, risk factor. If you have any weakness in the lower limb, or in your hip girdle, or pelvic girdle, or lumbopelvic girdle, so wait, it's that kinetic chain, then that can also lead to ankle injuries as well. So we always address the swelling. We initially initiate ice. And then we can also then progress to contrast baths. We're often very aggressive early on in terms of range of motion, boot when appropriate though. And then we do early initiation of perineal strengthening and proprioceptive training. But there was an interesting study that showed dancers who sustained an ankle sprain still had an altered sensor motor, sensor motor neural control compared with those without a prior injury. So even when you really work at it, they can sometimes be still left with a little bit of a deficit. And now the case continues. He like, comes back. He's like, Doc, uh, I'm still having pain, but it's now along the lateral aspect of my foot. And it feels like I really can't get through my midfoot correctly. God, something feels like it's maybe shifting or stuck. So you take a look at him, and I always have the priv privilege of being at the Boston Ballet of being with Heather Otera, and so often I'll have them right next to me. And you notice that there's tenderness over the plantar aspect of the cuboid. Um, and you notice that maybe there's this step off right there. What, what, what could that be? What do you think's going on? Yeah, cuboid subluxation. This is something I'd never heard of until I started reading more and seeing, reading more dance literature and, and seeing more dancers. And so cuboid subluxations can happen acutely from an ankle sprain. You can have some ligamentous instability, um, as, well, as well as some peroneal dysfunction, and then overuse. You do the repetitive motion, such as that rising up into to demi point on point. And the dancer will come in with this lateral midfoot pain right around the cuboid. And often they'll give you that history of, I can't quite get through the midfoot. And often will interfere with the peroneal tendon. So sometimes it can almost look like it's a peroneal tendon issue. And if you have a skilled manual therapist, they can perform a, a whip maneuver. That I would have one of the therapists describe to you. I never do this, and there's a picture of it here. Um, and also taping and strapping and orthotics as well. Okay. You guys doing okay? All right. So now you have a 14-year-old female dancer who comes in with dorsal foot pain, so pain on the top of her foot. 
She states it's been worsening with activity. She's maybe been increasing the volume of her training and preparation for some performance. She reports now pain at night. She localizes it over the second metatarsal and she's been rehearsing for classical ballet. When you take a look at her foot, she has a little swelling over the dorsum of her foot and she's point tender right over the second metatarsal. So what do you think it could be? Yeah. So over here, you have her plain film radiograph. Here's an x-ray of the foot. You can see the sesamoid sitting in there. Here are the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth metatarsi. Here are the phalanges here. Here you have the cuneiform, your navicular, cuboid. And here's the second metatarsal shaft right where she's tender. And often you will see this increased cortical thickening in a dancer's second metatarsal, and that can be a normal finding. I get the x-ray because sometimes I can see some periostal reaction or even a slight little fracture line that's starting to develop, but sometimes I don't. So if I'm clinically suspicious enough, often I'll obtain an MRI. And here's an MRI of her foot. Again, you can see the first metatarsal, second metatarsal, T2 weighted image, and you can see this stress change inside the shaft indicative of her stress injury to the second metatarsal. So as you guys suspected, she has a metatarsal stress fracture, which is, the, which is essentially a, a, a microfracture you can consider it of the bone. And bone is really dynamic. I always use this analogy. It's not a rock. It's not sitting there kind of like, ugh. It's constantly remodeling itself, constantly trying to change itself to accommodate to this, the stress that you're putting on it. So it wants to change the architecture. And it says, OK, you want to start dancing on point? Well, this is what I have to do. But the bone has to remodel itself to do that. And if you keep loading it and loading it and loading it, it doesn't have the opportunity to do that. And that's how these stress injuries develop. More goes into it than that. But the first and second metatarsals bear the majority of weight when the dancer's demi point or full point. And sometimes these proximal stress injuries actually look like Liz Frank injuries. Again, why you have to have a broad differential. And there's many risk factors, things like the female athlete triad, which Dr. Ackerman's going to talk to you more about. The number of hours dance per day has been associated with dancing more than five hours per day, i.e. summer dance intensives, and then even having a Morton's type foot morphology where that second ray is longer. And the triad, I'm sure you guys have all heard about, again Dr. Ackerman will talk more about, is this interrelated spectrum of decreased energy availability due to either disordered eating or an eating disorder that can influence the hypothalamic pituitary axis and influence a woman's menstrual cycles and create some irregularity. And that can affect the bone density both directly from a decreased energy availability perspective from micro and macronutrients and also through irregular cycles. And so we treat these conservative air cast boot modification, um, but we try to keep these dancers moving with exercise Pilates and aquatic therapy. My final case is I think I have a bunion. You have a 16-year-old female multidisciplinary dancer who comes in and she's like, oh, I have this big bump and it really hurts and it gets swollen. What do I do? And you take, mom's like, yeah, I have them too. And my grandmother had them too. And uh, you take a look and you see the below. And so you obtain this plain film radiograph, and here you can see, here's the proximal phalanx, and you can see this increased angle between the proximal phalanx and the first metatarsal. And you're like, yep, you've got a bunion. In my world, it's hallux valgus. And so there's this debate, does dancing cause bunions? What, what's going on? And there have been a lot of studies, and it's, it's still up for debate. But we think it's genetic. There's a familial tendency to it. And one study found that it's not more frequent than in a similar age non-group of dancers, or in a similar age group of non-dancers. So, But often, you can think of things like risk factors, like if the dancer's super flexible, if they're forcing their turnout, really increasing the strain on the first MTP. When you're dancing on point, that probably doesn't help it. If you're shoving your foot into a point, you probably doesn't help it. But it's likely, likely this uh, familial tendency. We always encourage conservative. We almost never have recommended surgery because surgery can decrease the range of motion of that joint, and that can be career-ending. So we have a lot of modifications for shoe padding, toe spacers, night splints, um, looking at the point shoe evaluation, and Ellen and um, Ruth will likely talk more about that. Intrinsic foot strengthening, proper alignment, um, especially with the young dancers. So, that's the end of my talk. I just want to say thank you. And in terms of prevention, that's really what this is all about. It involves communication between all parties involved. And we really want to just make sure we're paying attention to each unique dancer and their unique, unique attributes. So thank you.